listening to Conferences on Lyme Allergy, special Wednesday evening edition, brought to you by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm Dr. Jay Portnoy, Chief of Allergy at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, and I'll be your host this evening. First up, Dr. Lanny Rosenwasser will fill us in on what's new with vasculitis. A little later, we'll talk with Linda Cox about the latest advances in immunotherapy. And finally, we'll meet the president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, Dr. Richard Gower. We have a full evening ahead of us, so sit back and get ready for Conferences Online Allergy, special Wednesday evening edition. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lanny Rosenwasser. Dr. Rosenwasser is the D. Lyons Missouri Endowed Chair in Immunology Research. He's also a professor of pediatrics in the Allergy Immunology Division at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. And he's a professor of pediatrics, medicine, and basic science at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Rosenwasser. Thank you very much, Jay. It's a, a pleasure to, to, to speak with everyone tonight and uh, to review a little bit about vasculitis. Uh, um, I presume I'll be able to ask you to advance the slides as we go through it. I would so be happy to do that. We might as well get to the first one after this title slide. And um, the, um, the outline of what we're going to speak about tonight uh, will be predominantly focused on uh, uh, the Churg-Strauss syndrome, which is allergic angiitis and granulomatosis. And um, if one thinks about vasculitis here on this slide, you can see there are four major categories or subclassifications of the disease. The definition of vasculitis is hemorrhage and necrosis of blood vessels due to inflammation within the blood vessels with fibrinoid necrosis and uh, extravasation of red cells and, and tissue damage. Uh, and obviously those kinds of changes can occur anywhere in the body where there are blood vessels so that multiple organ systems are often the target. Um, the uh, way in which one thinks about vasculitis is to um, um, look at these major categories. Uh, the necrotizing arteritides um, are the ones that Churg Strauss is uh, one of the ends of. Uh, and in fact, all of the necrotizing arteritides predominantly attack medium-sized muscular arteries. Um, on the one end of the spectrum of these necrotizing arteritides is uh, polyarteritis nodosa. And the classic PAN, uh, as diagnosed in 1866 and first described by Chris Small and Meyer, um, did not include either eosinophilia or pulmonary involvement. Um, the Churg-Strauss syndrome, which we'll go through in some detail, was really identified in 1951. And it's the other end of the spectrum of uh, the necrotizing arteritides. And in between, there's sort of an overlap called microscopic polyangiitis, which is actually the name given to this overlap syndrome uh, in, in Europe. Uh, it was originally called systemic necrotizing vasculitis by um, some of the uh, clinical researchers here in the US. But microscopic polyangiitis has some characteristics, both of PAN and of Churg-Strauss. Uh, namely, uh, Churg-Strauss has a, a high degree of eosinophilia. Uh, a history of atopy and um, hyperusinophilia associated with it uh, with significant pulmonary involvement. Microscopic polyangiitis has most of the characteristics of polyarteritis nodosa, but has uh, lung involvement uh, as well. Um, the granulomatous vasculitides uh, include uh, Wegener's granulomatosis and lymphomatoid granulomatosis, which is a little bit different than some of the other necrotizing arteritides. Wegener's is um, a disease predominantly of the upper and lower airway with granulomatous uh, vasculitis in those and uh, significant glomerulonephritis associated with those two respiratory sites for inflammation. Lymphomatoid granulomatosis has a similar pattern of distribution, uh, but the pathology and the pathogenesis is a little bit different in that illness, uh, although um, many of the lymphoid infiltrations that causes the vasculitis in lymphomatoid granulomatosis is due to oligoclonal T cells that are on the way to becoming lymphomatous. Uh, a, little, a little bit of a different circumstance in Wegener's. Temporal arteritis uh, is uh, probably the most common of the granulomatous vasculitides, and Takayasu's arteritis involves granulomatous vasculitis of the great vessels. 
The most common vasculitis syndrome is hypersensitivity vasculitis. This is a vasculitis that's for predominantly a venulitis, a post-capillary venulitis, that's seen in a variety of re reactions, uh, drug reactions, serum sickness, uh, secondary to infection. The vasculitis uh, with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, when vasculitis coexists with those autoimmune disorders, is predominantly of this hypersensitivity vasculitic uh, component. Henoch showing line purpura, central mixed cryoglobulinemia, uh, and uh, the kinds of vasculitis and vascular um, irritation that one sees with uh, cancer, for example, is uh, in this category. And this is the most common uh, of the vasculitides. So we'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology of this disease uh, in the midst of our discussion of church stress for reasons that will become apparent. There are a bunch of other miscellaneous vasculitides that don't fit into these three major categories ranging from Kawasaki's disease to Bichette's to erythema multiforme, erythema nodosum, uh, erythema elevatum diatinum, voigt koyanagi harada syndrome, all very unusual vasculitides that have a very uh, rare profile in terms of how uh, often they are seen in the general population. OK, that is the overview of the classification, so let's move on now. Um, the diagnosis of vasculitis for many years has been uh, essentially controlled by rheumatologists. And as many of you know, uh, rheumatologists, going back to their history with rheumatic fever and Jones criteria, uh, like to look at diagnosis utilizing either markers with autoantibodies or algorithms in which seven or eight criteria, for example, uh, make up the algorithm for diagnosis in which you have five out of seven or six out of eight or four out of six of various characteristics. Uh, that leads to about a 95% confidence interval that the diagnosis could be made. About 20 years ago, uh, the discovery of the autoantibodies that are anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies uh, that were associated with especially the necrotizing arteritides were done. The uh, cytoplasmic ANCA, or C-ANCA, in which the cytoplasmic protein that's a component and the target for the autoantibody in vasculitis is proteinase 3, is seen predominantly in Wegener's, as we'll show. Um, these autoantibodies do not make up a 100% or a 98% specificity and or um, uh, accuracy in terms of uh, uh, percentages of patients with the syndrome who have these autoantibodies. So there are both false positives and false negatives in vasculitis with uh, anti-P or C ANCA. The P ANCA refers to the perinuclear pattern of staining with the anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. Um, and this is seen more dominantly in the microscopic polyangiitis, PAN, and Church strauss characteristics. But it's been described in a variety of other illnesses, including rheumatoid arthritis, HIV infection, hepatitis, inflammatory bowel disease, with low levels of positivity. And in this circumstance, this perinuclear uh, ANCA has about four or five different proteins that are cytoplasmic neutrophil proteins that are targets for the autoantibodies, ranging from myeloperoxidase to capsin to lactoferrin to elastase. A lot of the intracellular enzymes that one can detect in neutrophils are very often the targets for these less focused antibodies, if you will, as compared to the anti c ankas Next one. Um, these antibodies have been shown and were initially shown to correlate with actual response to different therapies. And this is uh, essentially measurements done in subjects uh, from the UK by Martin Lockwood, who was at Cambridge, who was able to show that after treatment for microscopic polyangiitis, that there was actually a drop in titer of the ANCAs in the patients with uh, the microscopic polyangiitis. And this is generally true in circumstances of um, populations of vasculitic patients that are analyzed. But in any one patient, uh, there may not be a correlation uh, exactly with disease activity and titer of ANCA and with um, drop in ANCA titer with treatment. While it looks nice when you look at this stuff in papers, uh, when you treat individual patients, uh, there may or may not be a good correlation between uh, ANCA titers and uh, state of disease and response to therapy although it's something that should be followed in case in that particular patient is a good marker. It's a good biomarker. OK, next one. The, in terms of the relative uh, positives with uh, antibodies uh, that are anti-C ANCA or anti-P ANCA, you can see here the 
distribution. And it's, in, it's entirely possible that some patients who have um, a particular form of vasculitis could have antibodies to both, although that's not a common circumstance. Anti-CANCA um, has got a high degree of specificity, relative specificity for Wegener's, and 80% of Wegener patients uh, will have a positive CANCA, whereas only 14% of the Wegener patients will have a positive PANCA. In microscopic polyangiitis, it's about half of the patients um, will respond to either or, uh, and that's not additive since there are some that will respond to both as well. And as I said, there are both false positives and false negatives with these autoantibodies and the diagnosis of vasculitis. In Churik-Strauss, it's somewhat reversed. Uh, Pianca tends to be a positive uh, in a higher percentage, uh, and Cianca is a, a little bit more unusual. In classic PAN, the kusmal meyer variety that I mentioned, which is predominantly a um, uh, vasculitis in the terms of the abdominal uh, muscular arteries uh, ranging from the celiac axis to the arteries, um, the percentages of uh, antiancus are a little bit lower, as you can see. Okay, let's uh, move on. I think uh, the... Uh, Characteristics of uh, Churg Strauss or allergic angiitis and granulomatosis is listed here. Um, one of the reasons I like to give talks about vasculitis is that uh, I um, had the opportunity to work at the National Institutes of Health with Dr. Sheldon Wolf, who was a pioneer in this disease, and I'm proud to say he was a mentor of mine. I worked with him for 11 years at Tufts and saw many of the patients who got referred uh, to him uh, with this diagnosis and um, participated in their care and treatment. And when I first started talking about these diseases, all these vasculitides, most of them have a mean age of onset uh, in the population of patients, uh, range of about 40 to 45 years of age. So I used to talk about this as being a disease of the middle-aged, and I now talk about this as a disease of young individuals. So <laughs> my perspective has changed a little bit on this. Uh, it's um, all relative, isn't it? Yeah, well, sort of, but uh, now it's a, it seems to be a younger and younger diseases. You know, Lenny, this Church Strauss was a big thing when, uh, what was it, uh, Z AstraZeneca or Zeneca's product, Accolade, came out. They, they thought that that was yeah. actually... Yeah, uh, I'm going to go through that information. I, okay. I have some information on that, on that um, <clears throat> affair, as well as some aspects. Uh, that precipitated an interest in looking at the general epidemiology of, uh, of vasculitides, which hadn't been examined in much detail previously. So it's a, that's a, a historical bump in this whole, whole uh, um, story. At any rate, um, with Churg Strauss, uh, pulmonary involvement is a very common involvement. Atopy and asthma is seen in almost all of these patients. And in fact, there is only one case documented in the literature of Churg Strauss where the Churg Strauss um, is not associated with asthma. Uh, and we'll mention that when we go through the different criteria for diagnosis. But the organ system, uh, you know, respiratory organ system is seen in over 95% of the patients. Skin involvement can be seen. Generally, it's a palpable purpura, which is a kind of thing that one sees in hypersensitivity vasculitis and is more of the immune complex mediated part of a vasculitic process rather than the arteritic form. Mononeuritis multiplex, uh, involvement of the abdominal uh, vasculature uh, to the point of hypertension, GI involvement, uh, renal involvement, seen in about 30 to to 60 percent of the patients with uh, Churg Strauss, arthralgias and arthritis is uh, a little bit unusual in that circumstance, uh, but still seen in about a fifth of the patients. Uh, next slide. Um, and this just identifies the actual changes that can be seen in these uh, organ systems. Uh, we've already mentioned some of this, but it could range. Uh, for example, in the nervous system, mononeuritis multiplex with polyneuropathy and uh, things such as uh, foot drop is a common problem with uh, vasculitis of the vasa nevorum, which, is a medi which are medium-sized arteries going up the nerves. Uh, but one could even have CNS involvement as well, as you can see from hemorrhage and stroke. Uh, the rest of the organ system involvement reflects the muscular artery involvement in those organs. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, actually a lung biopsy, and that is not a bronchus. That is actually a blood vessel cut on edge uh, um, in which uh, there's actual fibrinoid necrosis and uh, involvement of um, uh, inflammatory cells destroying the blood vessel and causing hemorrhage and necrosis. Uh, 
there's also the development of, uh, if you move that arrow just a little bit, a few millimeters to the right, you can see a developing giant cell right there where there's some palisading of some of the epithelioid cells right where that, just to the left of that arrow now. Uh, that's the kind of developing granuloma that one sees. But um, the pulmonary involvement can be a really intense um, bronchopneumonia, uh, and you can get fully uh, uh, infiltrated um, uh, lung tissue to the point where it's, you, you don't see the air spaces at all um, due to the intense inflammation. You know, it doesn't Next look one. like there's any Next room one. for blood to flow through this artery. Yeah, uh, this blood vessel is essentially destroyed. So. Oh, no. Uh, another another picture of the same kind of effect uh, on a more peripheral blood vessel. Next slide can be seen um, in which uh, there's actually full replacement of the blood vessel, and you can see the central part there. There's actually very little muscle left. Um, just to the left of where those arrows are, this is actually very close to the surface of the lung. This was done with a VATS biopsy, and that's actually the pleural surface, uh, serosal surface over on the left end of this slide. Uh, but in this, you can almost see these, this entire muscular artery completely uh, replaced by fibrinoid necrotic material. I don't see any giant cells in this uh, in this slide, but um, this is the kind of fibrinoid necrosis and destruction of blood vessels that one sees in Churg-Strauss. Next slide. Um, in terms of the diagnosis of Churg-Strauss uh, from a historical perspective, the initial description by Churg and Strauss involved <laughs> asthma, necrotizing arteritis of small and medium arteries, uh, and some venulitis. The venulitis is not the primary pathologic issue, although it could have some pathologic consequences. It's generally the nec necrotizing arteritis of the small and medium arteries that leads to the major uh, organ system dysfunction. Eosinophil infiltration around involved vessels and tissues. The original Church-Strauss uh, description didn't talk about blood eosinophilia, which later became a major criterion. Uh, extravascular granulomas and fibrinoid necrosis. Lanham um, is a, a, a um, Lanham, the Lanham publication was in medicine in 1984, and it was uh, a series of uh, vasculitis patients, Church-Strauss vasculitis patients that uh, came from Cambridge, Keith Peters and Keith Elkon and Martin Lockwood's group, uh, in which asthma, eosinophilia greater than 1,500 per cubic millimeter, which was a essentially cut off of eosinophilia that one associates with the hyper-eosinophilic syndrome, and systemic vasculitis involving two or more organs. The first attempt at really codifying the diagnosis came from the American College of Rheumatology in 1990, where there were six criteria that were used um, in which eosinophilia greater than 10 percent and extravascular eosinophil infiltration in the tissues were actually separate criteria. And of these six criteria listed here, asthma, eosinophilia, neuropathy, pulmonary infiltrates, and sinusitis, in addition to eosinophils in the tissue, uh, four out of those six were enough to make a diagnosis of uh, Churg-Strauss. And, and actually, when you read through the literature, it's not just asthma that is the major criteria. It's, it's the rheumatologists believe that asthma and atopy are indistinguishable. So that you could be atopic and non-asthmatic and make the ACR criteria for Church-Strauss. And there was actually a patient of Peter Weller's from uh, Beth Israel in Boston uh, who was reported as having Church-Strauss with eosinophilic gastroenteritis uh, and all of these other criteria for Church-Strauss. So there is one case in the literature of uh, Church-Strauss without asthma but just atopy, but these other criteria being uh, fulfilled and without pulmonary infiltrates because you only need four out of six according to this ACR algorithm. The ACR algorithm also fell down because it didn't include the pathologic diagnosis of vasculitis, which Churg, Strauss, Lanham, and the later modification of the ACR criteria uh, required. And is a much more stringent uh, uh, requirement for diagnosis. Um, the actual, uh, We'll talk about some of that uh, in the next slide or two uh, in terms of why that might be a, a, a difficulty uh, even even with requiring uh, uh, vasculitis to be diagnosed on, uh, on pathologic examination. Um, but it does bring out one point in, related to the management of these patients with Churg-Strauss. Uh, 
most of these patients with Church Strauss do not have un, a um, mild asthmatic presentation. About 90% of them generally tend to be late onset asthmatics, adult asthmatics, who have difficult to manage asthma and difficult to control. Mild asthma can be seen in maybe about 10% of the subjects with eventual diagnosis of Church Strauss, but generally not easy asthma, it's more difficult asthma that one thinks about this potential diagnosis. Um, and for that reason, and for the kinds of treatments that might be required for Church Strauss vasculitis, uh, getting the best and most comprehensive database as possible is the important uh, way to approach this. So if you have an asthmatic who has a real dense bronchopneumonic infiltrate, it's not reasonable to just consider it to be um, a pneumonia. Um, actually getting a biopsy of that lung tissue if, if, the, if the process suggests that it's, a, it's more than just a simple pneumonia complicating asthma. And uh, the same thing uh, if someone has a foot drop, uh, biopsy of a sural nerve uh, very often can identify pathologic tissue that will demonstrate vasculitis. And there are other ways to actually see it, you know, as I'll mention in the next slide. You know, Lenny, uh, when I see things like this where there are a evolving set of criteria for diagnosing something. This is clearly a syndrome and not a single disease. Uh, yeah. Asthma is also a syndrome. So you're trying to overlap two syndromes that are defined by criteria, uh, which right. makes you wonder, I mean, is, do people who have church strauss have bad asthma and church strauss actually have asthma, or is it a different disease? And, oh, most and of them really have. make any difference what criteria are used? I mean, what what effect does the criteria have on the actual cause of the problem in the treatment? It's an unusual problem. So having all of these criteria helps put it into a diagnostic category. Uh, we don't know the cause of any of these things. So um, you know the fact that they're both syndromes is probably correct. Church-Strauss, thankfully, is very rare, as we'll talk about in terms of in the epidemiology. So uh, it's not a major issue. But I think if you take a, if you see a lot of asthma patients and you're at the step five, six end of the, of the asthmatic scale, uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult uh, to, uh, to um, uh, uh, you know, to figure out exactly why they're not making the best response to therapy. And, you know, confounders of the more severe asthmatics would include this uh, under some circumstance. Why don't we see what's in the next slide? Um, this it. is sort of my, the way I think about it, and that is um, even if you do everything right, if you have a high degree of suspicion for church strauss um, you may still never get a biopsy-proven vasculitis. And part of that is related to the fact that the actual blood vessels are, I mean, I've shown you dramatic pictures of biopsies uh, that show vasculitis, but um, in reality, vasculitis is a skip lesion process, so you could have normal segments of blood vessel um, that look normal under the microscope, and there still could be vasculitis there. So if you have biopsy-proven vasculitis and three out of six uh, ACR criteria plus asthma, that's definitely making the diagnosis. If the biopsy is non-diagnostic, you could still have prob a probable syndrome with all these other criteria. Because if you're talking about most asthmatics who are step four, five, six, almost all of them have some degree of sinusitis, all of them Many of them have significant hyperosinophilia. Most of these patients are three-quarters of the weight of making an ACR diagnosis to begin with. So you have to see if there are other things going on. So if you have a difficult asthmatic, you want to make sure and see if their SED rate is elevated, if they have some other kinds of markers of inflammation independent of their eosinophil markers, because those are generally positive in a, in a vasculitic process as well. Um, developing and seeing um, nodular no-dose lesions on angiography, for example, or other imaging ways of looking at the renal arteries or the celiac arteries in Church Strauss very often will uncover these 1 to 5 millimeter nodular no-dose lesions seen in PAN but also seen in Church Strauss in the blood vessels. So one can see, for example, imaging or angiographic evidence of vascular uh, pathology. Um, nerve conduction studies could be done um, even if the sural nerve biopsy is uh, non-diagnostic. And then, you know, with the advent of ANCAs, if you get a positive ANCA, it, it means something. If you get a negative ANCA, um, that's probably um, more difficult to, to put together. So uh, this is how I think about it when I, you know, 
Landing consider what that diagnosis. What's the serial nerve? Uh, it's the, um, when you get foot drop, if that's the symptom of mononeuritis multiplex, one you might see in a patient with any kind of vasculitis, including Church strauss the serial nerve passes along the um, uh, outside of your uh, tibia, or excuse me, your fibula uh, on your leg, and you can do a biopsy in that area directed by n nerve conduction studies. Um, and you can see actually uh, vasculitis in the vasa nevorum. So it's one of the ways to sample an area where there may be pathologic changes in the blood vessel. But if you uh, biopsy a nerve, don't you cut it and, and lose it? No. Uh, the uh, neurosurgeons are pretty adept at just getting the proper uh, tissue in that circumstance. And That's the serial nerve is pretty big. Uh, you know, with loops, it, it's not a hard thing to sample. Uh, okay. We've had that, uh, I had a number of patients that we had made that attempt to diagnose uh, vasculitis when I was in Colorado and when I was at Tufts, and um, there's no residual in terms of that. Those patients all have a foot drop already, so you want to make a diagnosis as to what's going on, and if it's vasculitis, they can actually resolve some over time, the, the foot drop, although not all resolve, certainly. Okay, now we move to the next slide. Sorry if anybody's offended by my calling that Rosenwasser evaluation, but that's at least how I think about these, uh, these problems. Uh, there's clearly immune disruption in all of the vasculitides. You can see here a list of, of, of some studies that have identified immune dysregulation through a variety of measurements uh, for biomarkers in active Church Strauss uh, and amongst tissues and cells done ex vivo in patients with Church strauss So there are increased levels of soluble IL-2 receptor, thrombomodulin, eosinophil cationic protein in the blood in patients with active Church strauss There's some reason to believe there may be some issues about eosinophil biology that are related to uh, some of the um, receptors that are involved in apoptosis of cells. Um, levels of IL-10 in the serum uh, distinguished Church strauss where IL-10 was lower from Wegener polyarteritis and microscopic polyangiitis. And you would expect that there, and there's findings to show that there's increased T-cell IL-4, IL-13, and, and interferon gamma compared to healthy controls. And that's what you would expect from somebody with asthma, because all of those cytokines get upregulated in active asthma. And it's found also in the Church strauss group as well. Next one. Oh, that's the wrong way. Uh, there we go. Uh, these are all other factors involved in immunoregulation that are thought to be potential candidate genes for dysregulation in vasculitis. Um, the first three groups are eosinophil and, and lymphocyte-related things that are Th2 biology-related potential genes. But of interest, there's a couple others. Uh, some of the genes uh, that are involved in Q receptors have been associated with vasculitis in general. Uh, proteinase 3 as a potential genetic marker. Uh, the constitutive uh, INOS uh, uh, enzyme, CD18, uh, and the FIP1L1, which is involved in dysregulation of uh, eosinophil der uh, derivatives and, and some of the things that are associated with uh, with uh, hyperosinophilia. Next slide. I think um, in terms of other clinical points about the diagnosis, um, there may be form fruits of the church strauss. The prodromal symptoms may be there, but all of the criteria that one could reach may not be there. So I think that has led into the issue of the uh, zephyrlucast being associated with when it was introduced as a treatment for asthma. Uh, in, in terms of uncovering some of the some of the church strauss diagnoses. The major uh, differential diagnosis are the other necrotizing arteritides, Wegener's polyarteritis and microscopic polyangiitis, and the hyperosinophilic syndrome. Uh, thankfully, all of these are very rare, so it's like um, this is really splitting hairs amongst the aficionados to figure out which is which of these different things. But um, if you start thinking about any of these things in the, some of these patients, and then it becomes a little bit easier to sort of uh, uh, figure it out. It's a kind of these are the kind of diagnoses that if you don't think of them, you'll never make them because they're unusual. But if you do think of them, then it becomes easier to to differentiate what a patient might have in your mind. <laughs>
Next slide. Um, the case uh, of uh, accolade or Zafirlukast uh, related Churk Strauss syndrome uh, was reported about 10 years ago by Mike Wexler from the Brigham and um, Jeff Drazen while he was still doing medicine before he was doing publishing politics. And um, it involved a report about two years after accolade was approved for use in asthma. Uh, and it was a series of about seven patients with Churk Strauss who all had been placed on accolade within six months of the publication in JAMA. And all of them clearly had full-blown church stress syndrome. So it was a question of whether they were related and what, what the relationship uh, may have been. Um, around the time that this publication came out was when Montelicast, or Singular, uh, was uh, approved. So the first wave of these cases were much more associated with uh, uh, accolade. Although, as I'll show you in a few slides, uh, there was also an association with Montelicast as well. And a variety of other treatments, actually. Almost any kind of treatment for asthma has been associated with um, patients who develop a Churg Strauss syndrome, including, as the FDA has um, done labeling in the last year or so, uh, even Zolaire. Next slide. So the issue uh, 10 years ago was why there was this association of a leukotriene modifier with Church Strauss. Some of the early ideas was perhaps this was uh, a drug or class-specific response. It might have represented a bad lot, uh, much like the um, eosinophil contamination uh, stories uh, that had been identified in the 80s and 90s uh, with some of the um, uh, toxic uh, chemicals and the tryptophan, et cetera, contaminated tryptophan. But th those were quickly ruled out, as was the idea that there was actual hypersensitivity and an immune reaction to the use of ferrolucast, because that couldn't be detected as well. So there were two other theories, the so-called coincidental theory, which is what I think people have come to accept as the explanation for the association of Zafirlucast and Montelicast with Jerick Strauss. Um, and one thing that hasn't been really fully ruled out is an idiosyncratic reaction to those leukotriene modifiers, perhaps related to some unusual patterns of apoptosis that the eosinophils may have in response to these leukotriene modifiers or, or some other aspects like that. That's a hypothesis that's never been tested and probably is not correct, but um, people at the time were talking about that as a potential explanation as well. Next slide. Actually, the, the, um, the explanation that I remember hearing uh, them discussed some, the most was that people would get better on zaprolucast, decrease their steroids, and that would uncover a, a otherwise uh, hidden or controlled nascent, uh, yeah, form yeah. fruit church grouse. Yeah. yeah, that that idea is what I'm calling coincidental here. That's, oh, that's the reason the it's asterisk on the next slide. I sort of describe that. Um, oh, okay. In which amelioration of symptoms leads to a steroid taper or a reduction in actual. Um, other kinds of treatments that allows a more full-blown church strauss syndrome to emerge. Um, that explains the association with the Lugatrine modifier. And about the time, 10 years ago, uh, that this was being studied, um, Advair was not available in the US. It wasn't until about 2001, 2002 that Advair came in. But um, Ceratide, which was the European uh, form of uh, Advair, had been just introduced in Europe along the same time that the uh, accolade had been introduced in the U.S. And uh, Romain Pals, the late Romain Pals, a uh, pulmonologist from uh, Belgium, uh, had a series of about seven or eight subjects with Church Strauss who had their syndrome um, become apparent as they had fewer and fewer oral steroids and were placed on serotide and made a good response. So I think that was the the best explanation that indeed there was a coincidental occurrence. Idiosyncratic, I've already, I've already mentioned that, but there's no evidence that, that that fits. So this coincidental theory is probably the major explanation for the association with the leukotriene modifiers. Next one, next slide. Um, and in fact, the church strauss syndrome at that point uh, was not only associated with accolade and singular, but in uh, Japan, there were starting to be reports that came out that there had been a number of cases seen in individuals who had been placed on pranlocast. And there was a handful of uh, cases that had been identified in the same period of time of patients who had had uh, Zilutin. Obviously, Zilutin at that point had not had a very big penetration into the market. And so the numbers were much smaller, but those that had been seen as well. Um, 
there were actually church grouse diagnosis in that period, era of time when it was reportable uh, that was associated just with pure flow vent uh, treatment. And I already mentioned the serotide combination with the, the data from the, from the European Union. Uh, and actually, you could go back to the 1960s with the introduction of uh, chromalin. There was a report from uh, Bernie Berman and Al Sheffer out of uh, Boston that suggested that there was a, a, a rash of three or four cases of Church-Strauss syndrome that were seen with the introduction of chromalin uh, in the late 60s. So uh, this phenomenon of uh, getting asthma under better control and then influencing the amount of uh, steroid to control uh, the asthma being withdrawn, presumably, allowing the church grass to emerge. Uh, it's probably the best explanation for um, this blip of interest eight or ten years ago. Next slide. Um, in fact, um, there was a consensus meeting uh, that the FDA held that I participated in with a variety of other people with interests in this area. Uh, with all the reportable cases between 1997 and 2000 uh, seen. And there were 63 cases of church strauss associated with Zephyrolucast use, 47 associated with Montelicast. Many of these ones who had gotten Montelicast were patients who started off on Zephyrolucast and were switched from Zephyrolucast to Montelicast when that came into the, into the um, approval. And uh, some of them just had received Montelicast alone. And you can see here the numbers with Zilutin and Fluticasone, um, much less common, obviously, with the inhaled steroid Fluticasone, uh, but in small numbers of patients who receive Zyflo. So that's probably been the major explanation for this blip of interest in the association between um, asthma treatment and uh, church droughts. Um, and um, even within a couple of years, uh, there's coincidence reports of church strauss with Zolaire initiation of treatment. And um, I have to tell you, as I'll show you in a little bit, uh, I've treated a number of patients who had church strauss syndrome with Zolaire without exacerbation of the disease, in fact, an amelioration of their disease. So it's, um, you know, it's hard to know exactly how these fit because um, you know, these are two different disease processes, as Jay has pointed out earlier and they probably have different uh, uh, aspects of natural history in response to treatment. Sometimes they're linked, but sometimes they may go in opposite directions. So I think that's part of it. This data uh, generated some interest in having people look at some of the aspects of epidemiology of vasculitis. And that's something I'd like to just talk about for a few moments, and then we'll talk about the treatment of this process. So we'll try and get those um, both covered in the next uh, five or 10 minutes. Next slide. Okay. Andy, before you do that, um, do you think there's enough systemic uh, effect of fluticasone to continue to mask a nascent uh, vasculitis? Yeah, I don't know, uh, because I don't know exactly how the contribution of the vasculitis in the lungs are. And certainly with fluticasone, when you inhale it, you get a local concentration in the lungs. So it'd be nice to be really precise about how this all works. There's so few of these patients, so hard to study them, and it'd be hard to make judgments about precise mechanisms of pathogenesis uh, in that kind of circumstances. I, I, never, I never bought fully this coincidental theory. I think it was probably the major explanation. But I think that there's something a little bit different about the ones who have church strauss. And maybe it has nothing to do with their treatment with leukotrienes. It may just be the fact that, like I said, they have two relatively um, one uncommon and one common disease process uh, going on. And, and there's some overlap and some aspects of them that don't overlap, and we don't know what belongs to what syndrome yet. So but you'd almost think that if they were on fluticasone, they would have like a non-pulmonary form of church strauss Why would why would it inhibit them from getting the rest of the systemic? Well, toxicity? I don't think fluticasone cures asthma, so I don't think it will cure the asthma component in this no, syndrome. The steroid it, might with the suppress, it might be yeah. enough to suppress the pulmonary component of it. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, that may be one explanation, and there may be patients who might, you know, lead to that kind of a conclusion, but I don't think I've seen any of that have been cleaned that way in terms of you suppress the lung problem and therefore they're only getting renal involvement or neurologic involvement yeah. with their church strauss. That would be the case it. if it was the local effect. Yeah, well, uh, well there are a couple of things. First of all, I'm not 100% that the bioavailability of fluticasone is zero. In fact, I'm sure it's not. 
Mm. Uh, I don't know what the recirculation patterns of all the inflammatory cells and the lymphocytes that might be mediating this might be, and how much of that is uh, playing a role in terms of the site-specific process. So, you know, I think in our pure systems approach, you're probably correct, but I don't think these systems are that clean. So, but it's a, it's a good point. Well, in terms of epidemiology of systemic vasculitis, the guru for this is a rheumatologist who's an epidemiologist named Ron Watts, who's in uh, part of the National Health Service in the UK. He's also a rheumatologist. And in one of the um, incredible coincidences in this whole process, his wife was the, was the uh, major laboratory director for Sir John Vane, the Nobel laureate, who had done all this leukotriene, prostaglandin, pathology, physiology. So it's, he, he sort of like, um, he, he had been brought in to talk about some of these epidemiology of, uh, of uh, Church Strauss in relationship to Zephyrlucast and Montelicast uh, in some of these meetings that we had. But at any rate, uh, he's, he's done the most epidemiology on systemic vasculitis, and he uses as a base the UK National Health Service data. And he's based in Norwich, UK, which is the center for for his collection of this information. Uh, you can see here a couple of publications in 95 and 2000 on the epidemiology of systemic vasculitis. Next slide. If you look at incidence uh, of common vasculitides uh, utilizing National Health Service data in the UK, uh, uh, it's actually 1994 to 1998. They weren't going backwards, so I apologize for that. But um, the essential annual incidence per million general population for hypersensitivity vasculitis, now that's the commoner form associated with all those other diseases, is about 31 cases per million general population. For Wegener's and polyarteritis, it's about 12 per million. And for Church Strauss and microscopic polyangiitis, it's about 6 per million general population. So these are pretty unusual uh, data. In the US, I think the epidemiology data that the people at Merck had uncovered suggested it was more in the range of one to three per million general population in terms of the number of church Strauss cases diagnosed in the US. Next one. Next slide, please. Um, looking at it over two periods of time, um, there was really no significant changes uh, that uh, one had seen in terms of the relative incidence of these vasculitis. Even though these numbers have a little bit of a spread, they were not statistically significant. Next slide. And in fact, um, if you look at the incidence of Church Strauss utilizing data from the Mayo Clinic, Olmsted County in Minnesota uh, in the 1970s, and the Norwich data, they were actually still pretty comparable uh, uh, over, uh, over a two-decade period. So the incidence of these vasculitides, as opposed to asthma, wasn't, uh, wasn't changing significantly. Next slide. There was some um, review of uh, data that uh, AstraZeneca undertook uh, with um, Janet Laughlin was the lead author, and I was a consultant for them, which is why we had this uh, definite probable revised ACR criteria. And as you can see, the probable criteria is much too loose in terms of the rate per general per million general population. But if you used ACR criteria, and looked at about 36,000 individuals in terms of chart data review from United Healthcare. Um, if you used ACR criteria, the incidence uh, was about six per million general population. If you, in that 36,000, tried to use the definite Lanham criteria, which involved biopsy, there were no biopsy proven cases of Church Strauss in that possibility. And depending on whether you use strict ACR or a looser ACR criteria, you can see the differences in rates per general population. And this was published in the Annals in 2002. Next slide. There was a follow-on that was published by the um, epidemiologists at GSK, and actually I think Hal Nelson was a uh, co-author on this one, that actually just looked at the uh, post-marketing um, surveillance data with all the different um, medications for asthma uh, through the year 2000 and found that there was a stronger association of Church Strauss with the leukotriene uh, receptor antagonists 
as opposed to all the other kinds of treatments for asthma, including inhaled steroids, uh, oral steroids, short and long-acting beta agonists. Although I've always had a hard time with this data because it, it, the, the actual key to having practitioners report was the report in relation to the leukotriene modifiers based on that JAMA publication from Mike Wexler. So in a way, this data is sort of biased to, from the start. But you know, I, I think it clearly did show um, that the diagnosis of church stress was more often uh, associated with the leukotriene receptor antagonist rather than these other treatments. OK, let's go to the next one. I think we're going to just talk about uh, guidelines for the treatment of vasculitis. Um, you know, the major thing is when you have hypersensitivity vasculitis, you want to treat the underlying agent and disease first. So if it's serum sickness, you want to identify, remove the offending antigen or agent or antibiotic, if applicable, and treat the primary vasculitic process um, in terms of supportive treatment in those hypersensitivity vasculitides. Having the best database you possibly can and thinking about the diagnosis, if you're thinking about vasculitis, is critical. Uh, pushing yourself to get as much tissues to actually examine is sometimes difficult. You always have to uh, weigh the benefit, risk benefit uh, ratio in terms of being aggressive with uh, an invasive uh, biopsy procedure. But sometimes it's uh, important information to have because if you have it, as you'll see in the real full-blown cases of severe necrotizing arteritides, um, immunosuppressive agents and other kinds of biotherapeutics now are important as immunomodulator treatments in that, in that kind of uh, illness. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an important bit of data and information to have. Uh, next slide. The primary treatment for biopsy-proven arteritis involves cyclophosphamide. The old school treatment with cyclophosphamide would be daily low-dose cyclophosphamide for about a year um, for uh, a year's remission after the induction of remission in these patients with necrotizing arteritis. Um, very often, prednisone is given in a pulse fashion at the start of therapy, but rapid tapering to an alternate day treatment uh, should be achieved usually within the first few months of treatment. Uh, relapses uh, are treated as the initial uh, diagnosis and, and initial course. So if someone gets a year's worth of remission on treatment with cyclophosphamide and prednisone, uh, tapering prednisone, um, that is something that um, it will induce remission in 95% of the patients with severe necrotizing arteritides. Um, but very often relapses can occur, and the initial the relapse is treated as the initial course as well. Um, the old school daily low dose, one to two milligrams per kilogram cytoxan, uh, has been deemed too harsh by many practitioners now. So in place of the daily low dose oral cytoxan of one to two milligrams per kilogram, most people now utilize the approach that people have taken in lupus nephritis, which is monthly pulse cytoxan. Uh, at 750 to 1,000 milligrams per meter squared uh, via IV infusion once a month for six months to a year uh, to get a sustained remission. And then after that, uh, follow up. Other people may try one to two months induction of remission with the oral low-dose cytoxan, uh, followed by either methotrexate or azathioprine or Celsept, uh, mefalinate, mofetil, whatever it's called. <laughs> I have a block on actually naming what Celsept really is. But azathioprine, methotrexate, and Celsept probably can maintain a remission, but Cytoxan is much more effective at inducing the remission. Cytoxan, when it's given to a newly diagnosed vasculitic patient, uh, it really doesn't matter if it's given IV or PO uh, because there's got to be conversion of cyclophosphamide to about a dozen metabolites that work as alkylating agents in terms of anti-DNA. And then there are probably some non-alkylator effects of the cyclophosphamide that are immunosuppressive as well. So that's how it works. But it's the metabolites of cyclophosphamide come through, through liver metabolism that whether it's taken orally or via an intravenous route, take about 24 to 48 hours to generate those metabolites at the initiation of therapy. So those, that's the thumbnail of how to treat systemic vasculitis. Next slide. Um, I think this is just a 
as I mentioned, a celiac angiogram. This is in a standard classic PAN, but you can get this kind of a picture even in a Churg Strauss with those nodose lesions seen on angiogram. They can even be seen just on uh, uh, MRI and, and CT uh, and uh, any of the latest uh, imaging methods. But after treatment, you can see the next slide, uh, one year later in the same patient, uh, the new dose lesions are all resolved uh, and uh, significant improvement. Next slide. Um, there are immunosuppressive effects of cytoxane in the systemic vasculitity. Some of them are listed here. Um, I'm not going to go through them in any more detail. Next slide. Um, there are complications of this approach. And the reason people think that the daily low-dose oral cytoxane is too intense is that problems with either bladder cancer or lymphoma have clearly been demonstrated in that circumstance. And in fact, the metabolites of the cytoxan actually can irritate the bladder, can cause a hemorrhagic cystitis. So anybody who's on cytoxan, either the uh, monthly IV pulse or the daily low-dose cytoxan for a month or two before switching to methotrexate or azathioprine, um, should be advised to drink two eight ounce glasses of water before they go to bed uh, so that the metabolites don't pool in the bladder overnight and cause toxicity. Uh, you want to make sure these patients actually get up and go to the bathroom uh, at night. There are, as you would expect, other aspects of the uh, cytotoxic drug therapy, decreased marrow reserve, nausea, susceptibility to infection, herpes zoster, uh, all of these things can be seen as you would expect. Um, putting these patients on Bactrim if they're on cytoxin and prednisone is something that I, uh, I also generally do in these patients. Sterility with this kind of approach with the cytoxin, either the monthly IV pulse or the daily low-dose oral cytoxin is seen anywhere between 10 and 25 percent of subjects, and that's a major issue. In the early days where these diseases, including Churg-Strauss and Wegener's, had a 95 percent mortality within five years of diagnosis, um, issues of sterility and some other things like that were less of an issue. But now with this approach, where 95% of the patients go into an initial remission, um, you know, sterility is a major issue. A lot of times um, we would try sperm banking and, and probably egg uh, harvesting would be done now uh, if you had the proper approach. If uh, a young person of childbearing age is uh, being treated for this kind of systemic vasculitis, um, we could talk about some of that if anybody has uh, questions. Next, next slide. There are other treatment uh, modalities that have come up in the last uh, few years. About 20 years ago, the people at Mayo Clinic and in Louisiana pushed Bactrim as something that they said worked in treating Wegener's and Churg Strauss. Uh, but in reality, there is a lot of secondary superinfection, and there's a, very often things like Bactrim will help very short term. Uh, but the long-term uh, effects of the systemic vasculitis are not reversed by Bactrim, and that's not the right approach. Pulse cyclophosphamide I've already mentioned as an alternative to the, um, uh, to the daily low-dose oral cytoxin. Mycophenolate, mofetil, Celsept, azathioprine, and methotrexate are all alternatives once a remission is induced, either with the pulse cyclophosphamide, um, but the treatment should last for a year. There are some patients who can't tolerate any of these kinds of poisons, and it's inappropriate to use in them. Uh, obviously, very young pediatric patients, um, childbearing age subjects, uh, a variety of these other circumstances, you might not want to try any of these agents. IVIG has been used in vasculitis, including Churg-Strauss, with some benefit. Uh, with Churg-Strauss, interferon alpha has been used in, in essential mixed cryoglobulinemia and some of the other vasculitides in the hypersensitivity vasculitis category. Uh, we've used anti-IgE not as an inducing agent, but as something to maintain a remission uh, in patients with uh, Churg-Strauss, as I'll mention. Uh, there have been a variety of studies um, with Embrel, Remicade, and none with Umira, but that was uh, on the books, but never really got off the ground. Initially, there was some excitement about using the TNF blockers in vasculitis, but some of the initial anecdotal studies were never borne out by a randomized controlled trial in Wegener's where it was used. Rituxan similarly had a very um, uh, strong start in terms of using it as a 
treatment in ANCA positive vasculitis, but more detailed double-blinded studies with rituxan and ANCA positive vasculitis has been less um, less uh, uh, less um, uh, has been less promising. Uh, there was a randomized control trial of Embrel that was added on to conventional therapy, and you compared uh, Embrel in the relapses compared to standard therapy, um, and it didn't do any better in terms of a Kaplan-Meier curve. So the idea of Embrel being a better um, way to maintain remission after the initial remission didn't fit. The last New England Journal of 2008, the last week in December, had a paper that looked at methotrexate versus um, uh, uh, azathioprine in terms of that same kind of protocol for randomized controlled trials uh, for secondary relapses. And there was no difference between either of them uh, compared to the standard therapy. So the, um, the idea that methotrexate and, uh, and uh, uh, azathioprine are, are milder therapies uh, isn't really held up and I'd refer you to that last one, that last paper in the New England Journal. I don't have it on my list, but it, you can go to the last week of, uh, of December in the New England Journal just a few weeks ago, and, uh, and that paper is there. Okay, let me finish up here. Uh, I am, uh, my time is up, but yeah. uh, I always like Ooh, to I talk about this. The, the cartoons. Uh, and uh, vasculitides is a rare disease. It doesn't have a cure. It doesn't even have a spokesperson. But uh, it did have a very good advocate in Sheldon Wolf, who's in the center of that picture. He's one of my mentors and mentors for many other people in academics and allergy, immunology, infectious disease. And he really was the one who uh, designed all these treatments that uh, made these diseases go from 95% mortality to 95% remission. So wow. I'll stop there. And uh, thanks for this opportunity to talk about this. Thanks. Yeah, that was an amazing talk. You've clearly got a, a huge command of this information. I just am totally overwhelmed by this. Well, my command of that information came from Sheldon, working with Sheldon Wolf for 14 years at NIH and at Tufts. And, uh, you know, it's sort of like being an apprentice to a master. So I enjoyed that. And even though I probably are sick of hearing me talk about it, I like to talk about it because it, uh, it connects me to him. And unfortunately, he passed away about 10 years ago from any rate. So Thanks. I, uh, do you have any more questions, or, or I don't want to take up any of this time. Um, well, more are there any questions? Have, have, has cyclosporin been used as a treatment option, or not really? Yeah, uh, there have been a few cases where that has been utilized, but that uh, there have been a variety of other things that are immunomodulators that have been tried. Uh, none of them have really identified any any kind of positives uh, there. The problem is that the cytoxane has worked so well, and for some reason it works better than almost any of these other things. It's I mean, quite fortuitous. Uh, but cyclosporin um, has been difficult to manage uh, in terms of complications in these patients. I don't know about Church Strauss, but certainly in, uh, in the Wegeners, it's not been a useful circumstance because they're very prone to infection. Gotcha. OK, thank you. Yeah, that was great. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time! <laughs>